Hello, everyone. My name is Liz Lazo. I am the project manager consultant on behalf of the National Alliance for HIV Education and Workforce Development. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to review some housekeeping items. Uh, as you can see in the bottom, closed captioning is available today. You can either show or hide them if you're interested. Uh, please use the chat to engage with your fellow participants. And during the session, uh, we ask that if you have any questions specifically for our speaker, you can to use the Q&A pod and he will address them um, during the Q&A portion. Uh, the session is being recorded and the presentation and slides and recording will be added to the website within one week. For those who are not familiar with us, NAHUD is a membership organization of eight regional and two national AIDS education and training centers, the AETCs, that support the AETC program's mission. Established in 2010, NAHUD supports the AETCs, a component of the HRSA-funded Ryan White HIV AIDS program, which have an explicit directive to build and maintain a well-educated and culturally sensitive health professions workforce that can provide prevention, diagnosis, can treatment and medical management for people at risk for and living with HIV. Now who collaborates with multiple organizations in order to promote and educate on the work of the ATC program. Since 2018, NAHUD has been funded by the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry as a partner organization of the Opioid Response Network, also known as ORN, to address the intersections of HIV and opioid use disorder. ORM was created to support efforts in addressing the prevention, treatment, and recovery of opioid use disorder. Uh, ORM provides free resources and technical assistance uh, locally in communities across the United States and its territories. Please visit the ORM website for more information and or to submit a request for technical assistance. So for today's session, we are offering a CME, CNE, social work, uh, CE and a certificate of attendance uh, for attending today's session. In order to receive credit or your uh, certificate of attendance, you will need to complete the evaluation. The link to the evaluation will be added in the chat towards the end of the session. It will also be emailed to you directly within one day after the webinar. Uh, certificates will be emailed within two weeks of completing the evaluation. So at this time, I am pleased to present our speaker, Josh Swatek. J Josh graduated with a degree in political science from New Mexico State University. Josh has spent his career working in harm reduction and related fields, including as a community-based harm reduction provider, the New Mexico Department of Health's first overdose prevention coordinator, the statewide viral hepatitis prevention coordinator, and the HIV and HCV planning coordinator. Currently, Josh is the hepatitis and harm reduction program manager, where he oversees the statewide harm reduction programming, overdose prevention and education, and hepatitis prevention programs for the public health division. I am so excited to hear today's presentation and happy to turn it over to Josh. Thanks, Liz, and uh, hello, everyone. It's uh, it's great to be here uh, with you today. I see we've got a lot of folks from all across the country, and I want to recognize a lot of the folks from the from the great state of New Mexico here joining today uh, that actually do all the real work. I'm just going to highlight the, all, all the great work that they've done over the years and really want to uh, shout out to those folks that are, are with us today and everyone that's actually on the ground doing the work. Um, as Liz said, my name is uh, Josh Swatek. I'm the Hepatitis and Harm Reduction Program Manager uh, here at the New Mexico Department of Health. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Let's see, get those on up here. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about, give you an overview of what New Mexico looks like, an overview of our programs, and what we're doing in the future how we're addressing the needs of our community from a harm reduction standpoint. So as an overview of New Mexico, so New Mexico is a pretty big state. Uh, we're, we're spread out. Uh, we're the fifth largest state, uh, third large lowest population. Um, and most of that population lives in the central region of the state, it's in the Northwest region. So these are all of our public health regions. Uh, and the Bernalillo, Valencia, and Torrance County. So right there, the center of the state, that's where most of the population lives. And we have a couple of other populations throughout the state, but we have 
wide, wide areas. Um, I can drive from my house 30 minutes in any direction and be in the middle of absolute nowhere, uh, which is actually kind of nice, but does present some, some issues when we're delivering services for individuals. Uh, we're also a state that's uh, you know, very multicultural state here in New Mexico. We've got individuals, uh, we've got you know, a large Hispanic population, large Native American population, and we have over 23, we have 23 fairly recognized tribes and nations here in New Mexico. Uh, each have their own cultures and languages, so it's very, very diverse. So we have to make sure that when we're designing programs that we're involving individuals from these different communities to make sure that we're culturally appropriate, that we're you know, saying the right things, we're doing the right things, um, and we're tailoring our messaging and our services to the communities so that they're most effective. To give you an idea about substance use, uh, there was a 2016 um, model from the University of New Mexico um, that said there's about 14,000 to 22,000 people who inject substances all across the state. And uh, in the last fiscal year, so state fiscal year 21 that we have full data for uh, from the harm reduction program, um, we served over 16,000 people, uh, 16,000 individuals came to our services. So we're actually reaching most of the estimated population of injectors here in New Mexico. Now, things have changed, and we'll talk about that a little bit as the supply of substances have changed and how we've had to respond to that. As I've mentioned, we have some very, very key populations. We have groups of people that are sometimes harder to reach from a public health perspective. Again, very rural state. Um, there's there's a um, lot of folks that live in very, very small communities. Uh, we have counties that are larger than the state of Rhode Island uh, with a population of under 2,000 people. Um, that's that's something that we have here in New Mexico. You see that a lot out west, uh, very rural areas. We've got, again, large tribal communities that live both on and off reservations, uh, different cultures, um, and we have to be appropriately uh, addressing those and have organizations and involving them in our decision making as program as a you know state program. Uh, monolingual preferred Spanish speaking community members. That's huge here. Again, we're a border state. Um, so that, that's a very large and important population um, and important community members here in New Mexico. We also serve a, a, a large group of individuals experiencing homelessness as a, a program. Harm reductions frequently serve folks who aren't served by many communities, uh, who aren't, aren't treated very well. Um, and, you know, we, those are the folks we want to reach. Um, that's the that that's our population. So we we go out, we get in the streets, and we we talk to those folks. Obviously, people use substances, uh, both injecting or non-injecting. Uh, we don't care. We don't care how you use your substances, what substances you use uh, here in New Mexico. Our harm reduction program wants to see you, uh, because you know. Again, we'll talk about this here in a little bit, but it's more than just about the syringe. Uh, it's more about injecting. Uh, it's it's a larger, comprehensive program. So if you're using substances, we want to see you. Also, it goes along with serving folks who use substances frequently is people who are formerly and currently incarcerated. Our programs serve a lot of people. Um, so for formerly incarcerated, uh, we have lot, many, many people that are coming into us for services. We have people that work in our programs that are formerly incarcerated, and we serve currently incarcerated people too. As was mentioned, our program is inclusive of the viral hepatitis program. Uh, and I'll highlight some of the accomplishments there uh, here in just a bit. But one of the big things that we do is we make sure we work with our corrections department to not only test, but to treat people in corrections. So everyone gets screened for viral hepatitis um, upon entry, and everyone has the opportunity to be cured of that hepatitis from our state corrections pro, uh, department. So I think that's something that we really want to highlight, that we're serving communities, that we're getting out there, and we're reaching people where they're at, no matter where they're at. So with all those things that I've said about the state, there's going to be barriers to service. Um, when we're talking about these large distances between population centers, that presents its own challenges. To give you an idea, um, I just looked this up on my phone just a moment ago. It takes me 25 minutes to drive to work today. 
I looked to see how long public transit would take to get me to work. And it was three hours and five minutes. Um, so when we're talking about people who don't have reliable transportation, community members that don't have reliable transportation, that's a long time to go to a doctor's appointment. Uh, you spend you know, a good chunk, a quarter of your day, you're going to, a quarter of your working day, you're going to a doctor's appointment if you need services for MOUD, being treated for viral hepatitis. So we have to make sure that not only we have these clinics that are standing here, but we have to go to the communities and reach people where, they're, where they are at. Because for harm reduction, you know, we meet people where they're at in their substance use, but it's also about meeting people where they're at physically, going to the communities, getting into the rural communities, talking to folks, seeing what they need, providing those services. Um, many people say telehealth, why don't you use telehealth more? Well, that's great. Telehealth's fantastic, but also rural communities, broadband issues sometimes is uh, internet's not so great in some areas. Some people can't afford internet in those areas. So again, it's about making mobile services um, available as much as possible. We also face a lot of stigma for our, our, our community members, right? We've um, these are people who have used substances. We're talking about individuals experiencing homelessness. Uh, one of my uh, one of my colleagues uh, uses a phrase, you know, imagine that you're being, imagine that people ignore you every day, all day, every day. Um, you're just not looked at, you're ignored, people are past you. Uh, harm reduction tries to break those barriers down. And without breaking the barriers, we really um, the, you know, the, the, the public transit, you know, all the, without bringing down these barriers, we're not providing comprehensive services to the people here in the state of New Mexico. So given that broad overview of, of the state of New Mexico, I want to talk specifically about our programs here. So here in New Mexico, we've been operating harm reduction services continuously since 1998. Uh, so this was our 25th anniversary uh, this year. Uh, so 25 years of harm reduction as a state program. Uh, we're, again, a statewide program. It's offered through the Department of Health. Uh, we're a centralized health department, meaning that we don't have county health departments, right? The state health department is the health department. Everyone that's in county public health offices are employees of the one health department. Um, and again, we have a broad program, 16,000 people. We're reaching all across the state. We have over 50 offices, including public health offices and community providers. They're doing a lot of work. And people ask me, well, how did this happen so early on in 1998? How did you get this going when not all other states were doing this as a health department? Well, really, uh, 94 to 97. And we said, okay, what are the rates of infectious disease? Because remember, harm reduction back then was more about the syringes. Um, and we, we, this is what we saw. We saw very low rates of HIV positivity. We had evidence of previous hepatitis B positivity, so that's 61%. So 61% of people who had injected substances between 94 and 97 had at some point been infected with hepatitis B. 82% were currently hepatitis C positive, right? So 82%. So all of these bloodborne patients. It was uh, Governor Gary Johnson. Uh, his, his name sounds familiar. He was the Libertarian uh, um, Party uh, candidate for a, a couple of election cycles. Um, and he was moved by these numbers. They said, okay, we have this low HIV positivity rate in New Mexico. It's higher in other areas. It's a really simple cost-benefit analysis. We prevent infection. It costs the state less. That's how we were able to do it. Um, we, we saw the need and we responded to it from a scientific uh, standpoint. So that's how, that, that's how this really started. So harm reduction in New Mexico started by because we needed to address the, the, the transmission of an infectious disease. We realized it was a public health issue. Um, so we went forward to New Mexico. 
speaking of 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 hepatitis i want to talk on that just a little bit itself too uh, our programs are inclusive of hepatitis c we can't serve people who inject substances without being inclusive of hepatitis c we really want to make sure that we're elevating this and making sure that the community is aware that hepatitis c is curable we can cure hepatitis c so here in New Mexico, we did establish our plan. Uh, here's the here's the cover of our plan. We got a, a letter from the governor uh, signing on to it. This was published uh, last year uh, in June. Um, so this is really great plan. You can look it up on our website if you Google uh, New Mexico a hepatitis program. It's going to be there'll be a link to it. It's very pretty. It's very cool. Lays out our state really well. A little uh, quick two-minute presentation that I'm giving. I suggest that you go there. Um, so again, we're, we're treating people. We know that early on in, um, once we got the direct ad acting antivirals, the easiest people to treat were the first people to treat. And now we've moved into a phase of treating folks who are harder to get to. Uh, we're talking about folks who have seen people go through interferon treatment, and I think that's what it is. We're talking about young individuals, people who are active in substance use. We need to treat them. Uh, folks that we talk about with incarceration, incarcerated populations, they have very high rates in New Mexico. Uh, so what better place than to offer treatment than in those situations? Um, we also offer, we have a high risk pool here in New Mexico, so it's our safety net. So if someone is categorically ineligible for insurance, the New Mexico Department of Health pays for premiums, uh, covers co-pays for someone to get treated for, uh, and they have full insurance for up to six months while they get treated for hepatitis C. And when I talk about categorically ineligible for insurance, most people automatically think, oh, you know, uh, recent immigrants, uh, undocumented folks. And that's certainly a piece of the program. But also think about the young person who thinks they're invincible, like many of us did when we were younger, and opted to not get health insurance uh, with their job, or they couldn't afford it. Um, and then they missed the enrollment window. Um, so there's no way to, for them to get insurance and they want to get treated now. They have the opportunity to get treated. They want to get treated now. We can do that with this program. We have quite a few folks that are in that, you know, their they're, you know, the window opens in six months and they can't get treated, but they want, we have them today. Uh, they, and we might lose them. We can enroll them in this program. So, one area. Um, so this is this is really you know, a program that we're highlighting and looking to expand all across the state. Uh, and here in New Mexico, we have to, we have to name things. So a catchy name I have found that when you're establishing public health programs gives it uh, gives it more credence. So if you're establishing one yourself, give it a catchy name. Uh, this is Project Heat. We also have another one that addresses syphilis, which I won't be talking about today. But it's called Project Spicy. So we have Project Spicy, and we've got Project Heat. So we've got kind of have a theme here. And again, for categorically uh, ineligible folks for insurance through our high risk pool. Um, the current patient count is actually quite a bit higher than that now. Uh, so we've uh, increased that patient count now. Uh, this was when we uh, had to turn the slides in, so that's gone up. I don't have the numbers, but you know it's it's steady. But again, we expect it to be a smaller number because we have expanded Medicaid in New Mexico. Uh, we have you know treatment in uh, corrections department. Um, so this is going to be that the smaller number than some other places, um, but it's a very, very important and key part of our program. Um, and again, as our uh, clinics increase capacity, we'll probably see an increase in this because we're reaching out to more communities. We're adding more treatment services to harm reduction programs. Um, and that will lead to more folks on this. I uh, mentioned Casa de Salud there. They're one of our, I want to highlight just a couple of programs uh, that are related to this. And I want to say, uh, now there's, there's, I highlight these programs, but many, many programs look like these programs. Um, they're, 
they look very similar, but these are just a few that we've highlighted because they're doing some of all, all of these work. So Casa de Salud, they're a clinic here uh, in New Mexico. Uh, they're in a, um, uh, what we call the South Valley here in Albuquerque. They offer, they're a community-based clinic. They're not a federally qualified health center. Um, they offer you know, a lot of self-pay on a sliding fee scale. Um, a lot of uninsured folks, monolingual Spanish speakers. Um, they offer all of these great services and they integrate both primary care, acute care, harm reduction, addiction, and both traditional Western medical practices, both traditional medicine pra medical practices and Western medical practices. And they integrate that very, very well to make sure that we're reaching our communities to be responsive because we know that if we're not providing holistic treatment, we're not providing all the range of options, we're not really meeting our community. And if we're not talking to the community, we're not going out into the community as public health workers, as, as uh, government officials, if we're not actually talking to the populations that we intend to serve, we're doing a great disservice. Um, so this is kind of born, these programs that I'm highlighting are all born from that philosophy. Um, all these programs, Casa de Salud, they provide navigation services, IDs, um, HCV testing. Uh, they're testing everyone for hepatitis and their population. This is a group that probably hasn't been tested ever before. Um, so it's a great place. Uh, Mountain Center, this is a very, very rural part of New Mexico. So this is in northeastern part of New Mexico. Very high rates of substance use, a higher uh, high rates of overdose. So this is one of those programs that goes out into the community. They, they, they drive into areas that are hard to reach that probably don't have clinics, um, you know, very small communities. So it's very mobile, very, very rural, offer STD testing, hepatitis testing, they offer treatment, they have a wide range of services. Um, it's, it's a lot of going out in vans, a lot of driving around. Um, and it, it's worth it because reaching these communities is hard. So again, like I said, the philosophy of going to the community, going to where people are at and not relying them to come to you is an integral part of harm reduction. And Mountain Center does this very, very well. They've integrated a lot of medical services into harm reduction. So they've partnered with clinics because again, Harm reduction has gained the trust in our community. We've been around for 25 years. If you use substances, you probably know who the harm reduction programs are. Um, and if you're afraid to go to a doctor's office, if you're afraid to go into a, a health clinic, um, but you're probably not afraid to go to the harm reduction center because people are nice and they've been nice to you for a long time. This is a good place to make that when someone's ready to make a change to, to you know improve their health care. These are the places that people go who oftentimes don't go anywhere else here's also a slightly different model this is a uh, harm reduction program that's integrated within a federally qualified health center so they've been providing harm reduction for 15 years so we have a we have a clinic it's established the integrated harm reduction process processes into their clinic and knew that that would bring folks in that they're trying to serve because again the philosophy of harm reduction is meeting people where they are at um so what that does is that allows people to have that easy access to care so it's slightly different so the previous model that we had it's it's a harm reduction clinic it was a standalone harm reduction program that started integrating medical this is a medical clinic that integrated harm reduction and there's pros and cons to each. And it just depends upon where you work, really, what, what, what's going to work for you and what your community looks like. But again, this, this group um, does a lot of the, what you would typically see from a fairly qualified health center, acute care, primary care, testing. So it's the all under one, one roof model. Um, and adding harm reduction to that led to more people coming in for services, right? They, you know, I'm not saying people are getting services every single day, like, you know, every single client's coming in and say, oh yeah, I need my blood pressure checked. Um, but when someone does think about it, like, oh yeah, well, we can do that right now. We'll just walk you over uh, the nurse practitioner, or the, you know, the doc and, and we'll, we'll get that taken care of. Another part, portion of the program that I would like to highlight is our partnership with law enforcement. New Mexico has been partnering with law enforcement for pretty much the inception of, 
of our program. And we find it to be very important to the success and the outcomes. Um, we meet law enforcement where they're at too. So harm reduction is not just, uh, again, not just handing out the syringe. It's about meeting people where they're at. We deal with law enforcement too. Me as a public health official, I have never been a law enforcement officer. I've never experienced what they've experienced. So when we train law enforcement officers, well, I might show up and talk a little bit. We contract with current and former law enforcement officers to talk about the benefits of the harm reduction program for them. Because again, when you're learning from your peers, it's much more impactful than someone from, again, me as a public health official. They'll come and say, they'll be very nice. And they'll say, yes, we understand. Uh, but I don't speak their language. I don't know what it's like their day to day. Uh, I can only imagine. Um, but these law enforcement officers know what it's like. So it's important to use um, you know, community members, educate other community members. And this improves in community engagement too. Uh, the law enforcement officers know who the people in the community are that need the services. They're more likely to have better outcomes, better relationships with community members who are using substances because they know about the harm reduction program. They know about, they've been educated on overdose prevention. They've been educated on what folks are going through. Uh, they've been educated on where to refer people to. Um, so that really does make those interactions between the community members that we have uh, that are coming into us for services and the law enforcement officers whose job is to enforce the law. Those are better interactions because of the training and the awareness um, that we've established again since the inception of our program. Um, so that, that partnership is very important to us. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention it because it's part of an overall comprehensive program that we've developed. So again, people frequently ask, what services do you provide? Well, a lot. Um, it depends upon the agency. Uh, we have some organizations, like I've said, that are standalone harm reduction agencies. I would consider them old school harm reduction agencies. You go out in a, with a backpack, uh, um, some syringes, some foils, and you start handing stuff out. You start talking to people. You get out in the community. Um, you get out you know, really where folks are at. And we also have some that I've highlighted earlier that are integrated into fairly qualified health centers. They're going to look a little bit more formal. And each of those is going to have different capacities to provide different things. The base of our program is providing those safer consumption supplies and overdose prevention training, right? So overdose prevention training, everyone has that across the board. Uh, this is offered. Uh, we also have some developments about syphilis and uh, infectious disease. I'll talk here in a little bit. But here's some other services that we offer. Wound care, viral hepatitis surveillance, uh, vaccines and testing um, for you know, HIV, hepatitis, STDs. So there's a wide range of services. Also, People who need insulin, uh, who can't afford their syringes. Again, we've, uh, we've got again, a large population who might have trouble affording these things. Um, but we give those out to anyone. It doesn't matter. We don't, we don't, if you need syringes in our community, we don't care why you need them or uh, for any reason, we give them to you. It's a, it's a public service. Uh, right here is the Las Cruces Public Health um, office uh, we have a drop box we have drop boxes all throughout our community uh because again if we're going to be handing out syringes we want to make sure that we're responsibly we're being responsible neighbors we're collecting things back and again it's a community service so this is open to anyone in our community we have it as part of our program and it's integrated so this these are most public health offices they're private contractors uh and we're offering these for over 20 years when we look at um some of the services that we offer here, here here's a, a list right we have primary care medical services we've got direct services but i really want to highlight here the active navigation piece so when i talk about active navigation i don't mean that we hand someone a piece of paper that says oh you can just go down the street uh to give you an example we if we detention centers and this was before, you know, wide scale naloxone standing order laws were passed. And we said, okay, well, you know, we'll do the training here in the prison. 
uh, in the detention center. We'll we'll train you how to do it. And then if you show up, we'll give you some money to go pick up your Narcan. So we were paying people to get Narcan um, after they got out of jail, after they got released. And we saw less than half of the people that we trained actually showed up, um, even though we were paying them. So providing services, like buying just a referral and saying, hey, go here, even if you pay someone to go there, is really, really hard. Has a pretty high dropout rate. Um, when I'm talking about active navigation is we are doing a lot of handholding. We're taking people to their doctor's appointments. We are making phone calls for them. And we're helping them get IDs. We're helping them get food. We're helping them get services. We, we fund both and so we know as public health that if someone is worried about where they're going to eat where they're going to sleep child care any number of basic human needs if those are not being met the odds of success or even entering into any kind of medical services are much lower so we make sure that we're trying to meet those basic needs first and then if someone is ready and again this is all based upon client-centered approaches if someone is ready to get any of these services any of those medical services anything that we can offer that's when we can make an easy warm handoff uh, or in some cases walk you know right down the hallway depending upon the agency so right, setting people up for success without what we want, it's about what the community needs and the person in front of you needs. That's what harm reduction is. So I, I actually, when I they say, well, what's your goal? I'm like, well, my goal as a harm reductionist, as a harm reduction program, is to improve the life of being in front of me, not by me. Um, so I think that's a really important, you know, piece as government officials and and, and clinics talk about harm reduction. That it's harm reduction is successful because of that. We've also integrated HIV and STD programs to improve our program outcomes. So we have quick response. When hepatitis A hit New Mexico, we saw an increase. Uh, we had five cases in a week, which usually we see like two cases here in a year. We saw five cases in a week and we were able to reach those people quickly. Uh, we saw those increases one week. The next week we were vaccinating uh, out outreach is all in that area and by the week after we were vaccinated almost every harm reduction site in the state um it's still you know we still had a, a fair number of cases but we got it under control pretty quick comparatively speaking we're also seeing increased rates of syphilis all across the country harm reduction play harm reduction organizations are perfect places to provide syphilis testing and treatment. So we've made that a goal of all harm reduction providers in the state of New Mexico, that they need to integrate syphilis, both rapid and conventional testing, so that we can find folks and treat them. Uh, so again, outbreak control, this is, this is really important. And we're also incentivizing syphilis testing in these areas. So it's, it's not just about having it available, it's incentivizing it, saying, you know, I know your time is important. I know that you might not be concerned about syphilis, but we want to see, we, we want to incentivize and say, hey, if you have this, we'll, we'll pay you to get tested. Um, and if you, if you uh, need treatment, we'll get that treatment for you because we know your time is important and we're going to compensate you for that time because you're not concerned about it. We're concerned about it, but we need to be partners in this. So, Harm reduction over those reversal services. So here in uh, here in New Mexico, these are this is an integral part of our program. Everyone is directed to offer naloxone um, and overdose prevention for any of our services. So we have to distribute naloxone uh, to the people who need it most. Again, the research is very very clear. The people who reverse the most overdoses are the people who use substances. That is our primary target. If we have enough naloxone, then we expand into other individuals, right? The next is gonna be law enforcement, particularly in areas that are, are rural, right? We know that response times, if you look at your county, if you look at your county response times, um, you'll know 
who need what law enforcement agencies need in the lock zone if you're short on services. So that's very important, particularly rural law enforcement. Now here in New Mexico, it's a law. All law enforcement have, officers have to carry the lock zone, so it's not really optional. Um, so we do have that. But again, it started, you know, probably about a decade ago, making sure that rural uh, communities, rural law enforcement officers had in the lock zone to reverse a potential overdose. Uh, and we provide that training here in New Mexico. We're also able to provide fentanyl test strips to those most at risk. Those are integrated into our overdose prevention program. Uh, we actually just got that last year. We were just able to pass that law last legislative session uh, in, in, in 2023, so that, or uh, 2022, sorry. So that was a big change for us, but we quickly implemented it and they're highly popular. Uh, we also have expanded adult rent checking. Uh, I, I encourage folks to, to look at that too, because we know as the supply of substances across the country changes, uh, and it looks different, very, you know, very different from different areas, right? We have xylazine, particularly in the Northeast quadrants. Uh, that hasn't hit us. We're, we're primarily fentanyl here, and that hit us way later than every other part of the country, is having those adulterant checking services available to people so that we as public health officials, as community engagement workers, um, and our community members know what they're consuming. We can provide harm reduction messages. We can advise on overdose prevention services, and we can advise people on how to use more safely and provide that wide range of options, right? Harm reduction is about providing a wide range of options to our community members and letting them choose what works for them based upon their needs and their wants. So that service adds to this. So we've had these programs for many, many years, but we're not done yet. We, we need to expand. We need to improve. Uh, this is something that we're always striving to do. We have to be in the community. Uh, it's, it's a directive that I've given to all of uh, the folks that work at the state uh, with our programs is that we can't be separated from our community. We have to be out in the streets. We have to be regularly participating in outreaches uh, so that we don't lose sight of the people that we're serving. So we don't become uh, bureaucrats. And I, I suggest that for all agencies too, even you know, from, from a top-down approach, go out into our community, go out uh, and, and talk to folks. Um, I can say that here, in, here, even our cabinet secretary uh, for the health department, he went out on outreaches, um, mo mobile street outreach uh, for, for medical services. Um, and it was very moving. Um, so he, he goes out and does that. And that's a very high level person, reports directly to the governor. Um, so it's, it's a, it's, it's a top-down approach. It's, integrated into who we are as a program. And I suggest agencies put that in, because uh, again, keeps, you, keeps it real, keeps you part of the community. Um, so as we're expanding services, we're expanding services, MOUD, into to community groups, into, into rural areas of, of New Mexico. Uh, detention centers and prisons are gonna be required to provide MOUD here in New Mexico. They're not currently. We know that in rural areas, those, those providers don't exist, right? They're, they're just not there uh, to provide those services. Internet might not be available, but you know what we do have there? We have public health offices. So that's a great place to use public health offices uh, to expand MOUD capacity in partnership with both detention and corrections. Um, it's, it's, it's a great program. We're gonna reach a lot more people and you know, it's, it's not cheap but it's worth the investment. Reaching rural people in states is, is very important. Reaching hard to reach populations might be a little bit more expensive, but it does improve overall health outcomes in those communities. Uh, so making that investment is key to success of any health program. As part of this, we're, we're using you know, state general funds, we're using opioid settlement funds, um, and we're using you know, increased general funds. So we've just made a really big investment on access uh, to, to MOUD services. As I've mentioned throughout this, this presentation, uh, reaching people where they're at is very, very important. We've, we're expanding navigation and healthcare services all across the state. Um, and primarily we're expanding mobile services for individuals experiencing homelessness. We're going to where people are at in rural communities who might be experiencing homelessness, realizing that it looks very different 
from urban areas. We've integrated harm reduction into these practices as well. Uh, we've integrated overdose prevention. So all of these services that you would traditionally define as, you know, services for individuals experiencing homelessness, like housing, uh, hygiene kits, you know, all, all those range of services, we have, we're integrating a harm reduction model in rural New Mexico. Um, and then again, as I talked about um, earlier, the integration of medical services into harm reduction programs. In your states, in your jurisdictions, people trust harm reduction programs, right? If you have a long established harm reduction program, even if it's underground, right? Even, even if it's just someone that's handing out uh, a, a syringes off of a tray table, um, those are trusted people in, their, in your community with people who inject substances, right? These are the people who you can reach out to um, to help achieve the goals of achieving a healthier community. So if you're an HIV testing organization, if you're a, looking to reduce rates of HIV among injectors, this is the place to go uh, because they, they're trusted. They've, they've, they've done the work, they've built those inroads into the community and they're not scary, right? They're, they're part of, the, they're just community members. Um, whereas opposed to going to a, a, a clinic might, might not be the most fun thing for folks, right? There's, there's stigma associated with going to the doctor. There's just fear of going to the doctor. In fact, I don't even like going to my doctor. Uh, I work in public health. Um, it's a little scary for me. I couldn't imagine someone that's been through a lot more um, and received a lot more stigma um, going to the doctor. How scary that must be. So integrate those medical services into the harm reduction programs, integrate testing into already existing programs. Um, you're going to get a lot of bang for buck when you're, when you're working with, you know, harder to reach communities. So again, this is just an overview of what harm reduction is. I've, I've talked about this and I can't add on to it enough. It is, it is meeting people where they are at, no matter who they are, um, no matter what their thought process is and making sure that success is defined by their improvement of life as defined by them. Uh, I, I was actually asked during a legislative hearing uh, not too long ago uh, here, why don't, why don't you require treatment? Why isn't your goal treatment? And my response was simple. I used to smoke a lot of cigarettes, right? I, I was an avid cigarette smoker. Um, I, uh, I, I enjoyed doing it. I am a public health official as well. I am well aware that cigarette smoking is not good for me and leads to bad health outcomes. I had a medical provider um, and he would ask me every single time, you ready to quit smoking? You ready to quit smoking? You know, it's bad for you, quit smoking. Uh, you should quit smoking. I, I fired that medical provider. Uh, I did not feel comfortable because that was all about smoking, right? It was all about that substance use. I had another medical provider who is still my provider to this day. And she asked me, she said, do you smoke cigarettes? I was like, yep, I do. And she said, yep, I did too. I know you've heard this before. You know it's bad for you. When you're ready, if you want to quit, let me know. I went through it myself. I might be able to help you. That's why she's my medical provider today, right? She met me where I was at. She found something, saw that that was a brick wall, and then left the door open for change. Um, and, and, and it happened. So that's just a really basic example of that was a patient driven success uh, that wasn't driven by med my medical provider and their um, their goals. Um, so that, that cha it changes the paradigm. It's, it's about what I want to do, not about what they want for me. Uh, using affirming language. We're very careful, right? I'm very careful in my language. I talk about substances. Um, you'll see I I, I don't talk about drugs. I try not to, at least. Using correct language is very important um, to making sure that we're, we're not accidentally using incorrect language to increase stigma. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of loaded words out there, but on that same token, mistakes happen, right? We've, we, mistakes do happen in public service. I mean, how many of you have ever made a mistake when providing services and you immediately realized it? And there's something very simple that you can do that we teach all people in our entire program. It's part of our training um, process of what to do when a mistake happens is to take a step back, acknowledge it and apologize. Again, many members of our community have not used to people in authority or, you know, people in that, that power dynamic apologizing to them. So what could have turned from a, a poor 
situation where you wouldn't have gained a lot of trust, it actually flips that around really quick. Um, and again, like I said, active navigation, linkages to services as people need them, um, as people, uh, you know, it, want to change behaviors or, or, or change health outcomes or, you know, just use a little bit differently, right, uh, to maybe reduce abscesses or if they want to change from injecting to smoking because they 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 don't want to uh, be exposed to bloodborne pathogens those are all positive changes and acknowledging those those positive changes and making sure that we're we're, we're there for folks uh, on that journey of substance use because we know substance use is complicated and it's a wide range of of you know from from chaotic use to very you know very stable use to recreational there's a lot of things in there so making sure that our programs are client driven is all of our model here in New Mexico. I'd like to thank uh, some folks from our our, uh, our team um, who have contributed to this uh, uh, slide deck. Um, there's also my contact information there. Uh, that's my work cell phone number. Uh, if you want to call or text me, feel free. Uh, it might take you a while to get back to you. Uh, it's also my email address, probably best way to get a hold of me. If you have any questions that you didn't want to ask here, if we don't have time, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, I'd be happy to chat more. And I'd like to, to thank you all for uh, listening to me highlight some of the things of our program today. And I think we've got probably got some time for questions. Great, thank you so much, Josh. That was amazing and very informative. Uh, we did have one question earlier, but I believe someone from your team who's a familiar with the program had the opportunity to answer it. The question was, how are the supplies funded? Um, but we were informed that the program is funded by a combination of state general funds, tobacco settlement, and opioid um, settlement funds. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, we, we braid funds, right? I think I think when you're looking at harm reduction programming, it's very important. Uh, we have federal funds, we have uh, we have state funds, we have settlement funds, we have revenue uh, that we make from um uh, that we make from pharmacy uh, for providing um medication for hepatitis c treatment uh so you know some some funds are restricted some funds are and it's fine it's being creative and braiding those and finding out hey i can i can't buy syringes with federal funds we all know that's there right uh but i i can sure buy that with state general funds uh, i can put this money here and use it for this and this money here for that so that's how that's how we're funded and you know, braiding those funds is really important uh, to success and getting creative, frankly. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat or q and A. I I know Josh did an amazing job. Um, but we do have an additional question. Um, over the history of the HR program, have there been any emerging trends that have been surprising, some that were concerning or others that were encouraging? That's a fantastic question. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so what really, so here again, um, fentanyl hit us hard and fast. Uh, black tar heroin was the primary substance of choice for folks who use, this, use subs, or for, for folks who use opioids here for many, many, many years, right? We, we've had higher rates uh, here for a long time of op opioid use, uh, even before the prescription um, pills. We had those, some of those higher rates in the nation. And what happened is that in 2019 to basically 2021, heroin disappeared and it became fentanyl. Uh, so we had to respond incredibly quickly and we actually had to have legislative change to do this. Um, and we, we, we unfortunately saw a lot of overdose mortality because we didn't have that flexibility as a program to change the supplies that we needed, right? We went from distributing 16 million syringes a year to distributing three. Um, with That's with increased outreach, increased participation because we didn't have the supplies that people needed. Um, as soon, literally as soon as we were able to make that change, we saw numbers come back up, right? We saw overdose numbers start to decline um, a little bit. Uh, we saw uh, more people come back into our programs. So again, we weren't capable of being responsive because of legislative restrictions. Once we went to our legislator, they removed those restrictions and we were able to say, okay, this is what our community needs. Like we, we know what our community needs, make that change, make it happen. Um, and it was literally within months. Like we, we saw a difference in that six month period when we were able to operate. So that was very cool. Um, it wasn't very, I mean, it was very cool that we were able to make that response, but it was unfortunate we had that 
that challenge. Um, our overdose prevention programs, I also want to highlight those as well. I mean, they've, uh, they're, they're, they're successful, right? We had 3,075 overdose reversals reported to our program. And how we track that is if someone comes in and they need naloxone, we ask them, have you ever gotten naloxone before? They say, yes. Like, oh, what happened to it? And they say, oh, yeah, I, I used it on a person. Like, oh, was that person, what happened? Like, what happened in that situation? If someone says, oh, yeah, they were okay, that's a reversal. So we had 3,075 times that someone reported that uh, to us in our program. So I think that's, that's a pretty big success, especially when we're seeing these increases in, in, in fentanyl and, and you know, various adulterants in the changing drug supply, or substance supply, sorry. Great, thank you for that response. It's funny, someone did say very informative and thorough, so their questions have been answered. <laughs> I'm wondering if there are any additional questions. Oh, we do have another question coming in. Um, have other states had the success that you have had? You know, I think I think states are going to be varying, right? It's it's going to vary by state. We're we're very different, right? We're we're, you know, I, I always say we're we're a weird looking state uh, when it comes to harm reduction, right? We're we're a state health department. the The authority for the harm reduction program comes through us. Um, we we provide all the training. We provide all the supplies. Uh, we direct fund agencies, and we've done it for a long time. And I think that's mostly because of the time that we've spent as a program. So some other states have had you know, similar success with their harm reduction programs, but they look different. Right? You, you have county health departments, you've got California, you've got Oregon. Uh, Utah's got a really great program, uh, uh, Indiana. I'm just naming a few off the top of my head. There's more than that. So please don't include that as an all-inclusive list. But again, as programs develop, you know, don't take it as, uh, I, I wouldn't say don't take a, a state program as, oh, it's, it's, it's not as successful. It just hasn't been around as long. It doesn't have the time to develop and mature. So the time to start is always now, and it, it's going to change over time, and it's going to expand. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of a non-answer, but yeah, <laughs> it just looks different. Absolutely. Good point. Uh, do you also have first responders as part of your harm reduction teams like law enforcement? Um, so we work closely with law enforcement. Um, there's some law enforcement that goes out and, and, and helps. We have uh, fire and EMS that do leave, you know, naloxone leave behind. Uh, we've supported those sorts of programs and trainings in the past. Uh, there's also been groups that have gone out, you know, with law enforcement uh, to, to do harm reduction um, with moderate success. Um, just, you know, <laughs> depends upon the area. So yeah, it's it's been part of our programs in the past and it's, 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 it's part of, I think it's part of a successful program too, is, you know, making, making folks aware that law enforcement isn't necessarily scary. And, you know, it's part of that community placing. Um, and it, it's, it's a good aspirational goal for any program that's developing, I think. Thank you. Are there any, oh, it's funny, every time I think, um, <laughs> we do have another question. So what about the EMT and paramedics? I think in, in addition to the first responders. Yeah. Definitely. EMTs and paramedics, again, I've always carried naloxone here in New Mexico, obviously. Um, but um, but yeah, we work closely with EMTs and paramedics. Uh, in fact, we've got a, a harm reduction agency that's actually run by all former EMTs and paramedics. Um, so uh, I, I'd say that they've they've been um uh, they've been engaged since the beginning. Um, you know, a lot of places here are also the EMTs and the paramedics and the fire in many communities are the same uh here. So we, we've worked with them. Um, we've worked with communities across New Mexico because when, when we're working in a rural area, we'll take any partner we can get. Um, and oftentimes those are the EMTs. Those are the paramedics. Thank you. Just going back to what you said uh, in terms of what harm reduction might look like in different states. For states that don't have harm reduction programs or who are trying to um, get it off the ground and, and do you have any models? I know you went through a few models using New Mexico, but are there any that you can share in terms of where to start? Yeah, I think, you know, if you're looking towards National Harm Reduction Coalition, uh, the National Association of State and Territorial AIDS Directors, uh, NASDAD, they both provide direct technical assistance to states or agencies that are looking to start. 
I'd also say, you know, look into your communities, talk to the people who are using substances, because the odds are, even if you're a state where harm reduction is illegal, um, I bet you there's a harm reduction agency or there's someone providing harm reduction services because uh, that's how harm reduction started. And I'm, you know, there's, there's there's someone there that's providing services. It might be, it might be harder to find because again, they, they might be doing something illegal, um, but, uh, but, but they're there. So there's, there's a lot of resources out there. We're also a resource too. If someone wants to consult with us, we're very happy to share what we think and, you know, share any of our materials that we've developed and you can tailor that. All of our materials are developed by taxpayer dollars, uh, so they're all public information. Uh, we don't we don't hold back knowledge. Um, so so yeah, that's yeah. Just re reach out to those resources. You know, I I'm happy to help. National Harm Reduction Coalition, NASDAQ. You know, th those are all great places to go. Great, thank you. Seeing that there are no additional questions in the chat or in the Q&A, Josh, I wanna thank you again um, for, for you joining us today. Uh, extremely informative and, and a really great resource and knowing that we can contact you with some additional questions if we have any um, that is really helpful. So I just want to highlight that um, one, I did add the link to today's uh, webinar. We really would love to um, get your feedback, even if you're not requesting CE or, uh, you know, or certificate of attendance, your feedback is really important to us and really helpful as we plan our next sessions in our upcoming series. I also want to highlight that um, our last uh, session in, in this year's series will be on Friday, September 8th at 12 p.m. Um, this session will be um, party planning, treatment and management of chemsex and HIV. Um, and the registration is in the link. Uh, you will get the um, a post webinar email that will contain today's uh, a link to the recording as well as to Josh's uh, a PDF of Josh's slides. So if you have any questions, you can always reach out, but we look forward to your participation um, in our next session. And uh, we wish everyone a wonderful day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.